Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment, that show that brings you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And I'm Julie. And today we're bringing you a very special show that we're very excited to share with you. But first, we thought we would introduce ourselves a little bit for those that do not know us that well. So I am Tess. I have a PhD in genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics. And I've been personally obsessed with human microbiomes and the microbiome in general for the past mm, decade or so. Um, And then John, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Hello. As you all know, I am John. And my expertise is in medical microbiology. I've been studying the microbiome for, I'd say, about seven years now. Why I was motivated to do this test, I'm just curious of what's going on in my body. I'd like to see what those microbes are up to. And then today we also have a special guest, Julie, who is also my mom. Mom, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Julie. Uh, as Tess mentioned, I am her mom, and uh, I came to this uh, to help out with microbi gals, and I have been interested in losing a little bit of weight and trying to understand uh, more what's going on in my body because I'm not a big fan of fad diets, and I, I feel like there's a lot of chemical processes and things going on that I don't know anything about, and this seemed like a really cool way to find out a little bit more about what's going on on a microscopic level. Awesome. So now that everyone knows who we are, I want to go into a little bit about what we are doing today. So I want to introduce you to two different kits, the Viome kit and the Zoe kit, which we've done a little bit of research on. And today we're presenting on one of these topics. So who, what is the Viome or Zoe kit? What are these measures? They're a measurement of your gut microbiome, which we'll get into a little bit more about the science behind the gut microbiome. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about what our experiment is. So we devised this micro experiment between my mom, my husband, and myself to understand what our gut microbiomes are doing. So we took two different at-home tests, the Zoe kit, as well as the Viome kit. At the same time, we sampled our own stool and shipped them off to the individual companies and then have gotten results back from Viome, which we will discuss today. Now, there's a couple of interesting things that we might be able to look at with this. Uh, one, on the individual level, we're going to share some of our results that we've gotten from Viome. Um, based on what they have told us. But we also have some interesting correlations that we can draw. Uh, Your gut microbiome is established when you are born, um, particularly from your mom. So my mom is here today um, and where you can compare our own results as someone who I've lived with for a, a good portion of my life. And then John and I also live together and we eat the same kinds of food, um, but we come from a very different genetic makeup So I'm very interested to see how, what parallels we can draw between our three different tests. Does anyone have anything else to say about the experiment that we've created? I actually found it really easy just to perform. Do you Um, want to talk a little bit about how we did the test? How much detail you want me to go into? I mean, each test or each kit gives you a little collection that you poop in and then, um, there's this tube that has a uh, liquid in it and a little scoop that you scoop up a sample and you put it in there and you shake it around and then you seal it and send it back to the vendor or the company, I should say. Yeah, I think it was less gross than what you think it's going to be. I mean, it's, you have a, um, they kind of have like a sort of like a strip of paper that you lay across the, the toilet. And then when you poop, it catches it. And then that's, you use that little, um, that little wand and just scoop some up and put it in there. And, and it was, it was very easy. You didn't have to touch anything. They sent gloves um, and really good instructions, I think on how to actually perform the collection and make sure you had it right. And about like, once you got the, the sample in the tube, then you had to, you know, shake it so many times and they let you know, like how they wanted you to shake it and, and for how long. Um, and then they provided everything for, you know, the collection and sending it. So I like had everything just set up uh, in the bathroom and um, on the back of the toilet, I had like all the, you know, the instruments and, you know, they sent a pair of gloves and you put them on and you do your thing. 
And then um, once you have everything shaken, it had the uh, mailing envelope was all set for you. So you basically, you know, you didn't have to deal with the sample for that long. You just shook it up, put it in the envelope, and then it was ready to go. So I found it was, it was very easy. So it was a pretty easy uh, process indeed. And we all did it around the same time, which I think was about a month ago. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your gut microbiome before we go into our results. I think that gut microbiome has become a really big buzzword, but it's not always well defined. Uh, and so we want to talk a little bit about what is your gut microbiome as well as how it affects your health and, and what you, and what do we know, um, about what a good microbiome can affect in your own body. So to put in simplest terms, your gut microbiome is all the microbial world you house inside your gut. Uh, there's also the whole human microbiome, which will include all the microbes living on your skin, in your hair, um, on your, in your mouth, in your mouth. Yeah. So that every single spot has its own unique microbiome today. We're specifically talking about the gut microbiome. So this includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, yeast, and even archaea, which is a group of microbes that usually don't get a lot of screen time, I would say. Um, but they're being researched now um, in a lot of different ways as they apply to human health. Primarily, when we're talking about gut microbiomes, most of the research is done in bacteria. However, as the technology is getting better, we are moving towards more holistic idea of gut microbiomes and really trying to understand the function capacity of not only the bacteria, but the viruses and the fungi and the archaea as well. In the past two decades, microbiome has been linked to your health in a number of ways. Uh, it can do a number of functions for you to impact your health, including metabolizing your food, protect you from diseases, and even coach your immune system, which I think is really interesting. At As far as numbers, if we want to get into a little bit on numbers, they suspect that your gut microbiome, whoever you are, you have about a trillion different organisms jumping around in your gut. And this belongs to a thousand or so different microbial species. So it really is a ginormous community that you have living in your gut all the time. So to put that in a bit of perspective, we can think of it as a zoo. Uh, if you've ever been to a zoo, you probably looked at maybe 200 species of animals. Uh, and so we're talking about five times that amount in your gut in this very small space. So your gut microbiome, and we've touched upon this a little bit, is very unique. It's been growing and changing with you your whole life. Your gut microbiome has always been there for you and is always supporting you as you go on. And it will continue to support you throughout life. But just as some clothes don't work for you, some microbes don't work for you either. This is a very unique experience. And what we're going to share today is very unique to our individual circumstances based on where we live, what we eat, our own lifestyle and behaviors. So I will allow John to now talk a little bit about why the microbiome is important. Why is it important? Well, it does a lot of things for us, but I'll start with things called short chain fatty acids. These are things that come from fiber and we can't digest fiber, but the bacteria in our gut can. And what they do is they ferment it into these short chain fatty acids with the most commons being butyrate, propionate, and acetate, which the body needs. So butyrate, which may be the most well-known one, it's an energy source for the cells that line the large intestine. It's beneficial for, has a beneficial effect on glucose and energy homeostasis and is essential for the body to make intestines uh, anaerobic or lacking of oxygen, which our healthy gut microbiome really needs to thrive. We also have propionate, which helps regulate glucose uh, generation of the body as well as the uh, filling full and acetate, which is important in cholesterol metabolism, metabolic uh, formation of fat, and may be involved in appetite regulation. Not only that, uh, some of the beneficial microbes love to eat acetate. In addition, uh, studies of short chain fatty acids have also correlated with the presence with reduced insulin resistance. So remember to eat your recommended amount of daily fiber. So this also brings us to dysbiosis or the micro being out of whack. 
along with the lower diversity of the number of different species of microbes that have been linked or correlated to many different health conditions. In particular, studies have shown that lower diversity, which is less favorable, has been seen in irritable bowel disease, diabetes, psoriatic arthritis, and Crohn's disease. In addition, lower diversity and dysbiosis has been correlated with immune dysregulation, long-term weight gain, and obesity. One of the most familiar studies was using human fe uh, fecal samples by healthy and obese individuals that were implanted in mice. And interestingly, those that got the fecal implants from the obese people gained more weight than the healthy counterparts. So our gut microbiome is also important in um, weight control, it looks like. And it also helps protect us from diseases or uh, infections. A great example is with uh, C. diff, which a lot of people have probably heard, even though people even though people can become infected with this microbe, it can, it can commonly be found in people. Uh, I think it's around 10%, but the healthy bacteria keep it in check. So it's living there, but it's not getting out of control, out of whack. And an issue arises when the microbiome can become dysbiotic, such as taking antibiotics. Uh, with the lack of microbes, C. diff can grow and cause uh, a diarrheal disease, which is really hard to treat. The gut microbiome is also important in vitamin production, and many microbes in your intestines can make water-soluble vitamins, which include vitamin B. In fact, you get vitamin B12 exclusively from your gut microbiome. You don't take supplements, that is. In addition, you get half your daily vitamin K from your gut. So... Yeah, they're, they're in there and they're doing a lot of things. Julie, can you tell us how the microbiome affects the health? Well, I probably can't tell you exactly how it affects the health because I think there's uh, quite a bit of studying going on at this time. Um, this is, you know, it's not news to us that there are microbes in the gut, but I think that it's more recent that we've had a lot of studies on how your gut microbiome may be affecting uh, your health. And as you mentioned, you know, some of the chronic diseases that, um, you know, definitely affect people's health, diabetes, our cardiovascular diseases, um, your hormone levels, all of those things can be affected by your gut microbiome. And so I think that um, there have been, you know, I think there's a lot of ongoing studies. And I think over the next few years, I think we're going to learn a whole lot about what the gut microbiome is and, and how it affects people. And I think the, um, you know, your, your gut microbiome is, you know, processing all of the, the food that you take in and also your ability to digest and use those nutrients. Uh, obviously all of the cells in your body, your, your brain, your heart, your lungs, uh, your blood, your bones, everything uh, is requiring nutrients. And so those nutrients come in through your you know, through what you eat and your microbiomes are, is, is what's processing all of that. And if it's not effective at processing certain things, then those are nutrients that are not getting to those various body parts. And over time, that is what, you know, can be the cause of disease. Um, it also is affecting, you know, your chemical makeup. So your mental, you know, status and how you uh, how you process things, your mood, um, all affected by your hormones. And there's been, you know, quite a few studies now that, you know, an unhealthy microbiome is leading to, um, you know, imbalances in hormones, which are affecting, uh, you know, people's moods and, uh, you know, uh, mental health, you know, disorders that like depression and, and anxiety, all of those, um, you know, they haven't quite nailed the whole thing down yet, but they have definitely found correlations between, you know, how your gut microbiome is functioning to that, uh, to those processes. So I think as um, time goes by, we're certainly going to be finding out more. Um, so I think these kits are really exciting to kind of figure that out. I think, you know, as a lay person, I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, you know, I passed on my microbiome to her unknowingly, like, you know, you pass along a lot of things to your kids. Um, but I, and you your know, mitochondria and my mitochondria and all kinds of, you know, smartness, stuff like that. 
Um, so, but my microbiome was something that, you know, we didn't think about, you know, back then. Um, so I think it's really interesting. And I think that, um, you know, as time goes by, we're going to find out more and more. And, and I think part of the, these kits, what they say is that we are kind of contributing to that science and to the, um, you know, the database, if you will, of, of people's microbiomes and how they, um, they're working. And I think it's uh, kind of exciting to be part of it. Yeah. And I think, I think one thing that you said there that I just want to reiterate, cause I think it's a really good point to keep in mind is that most of everything in the field of microbiome is correlationally drawn. Um, there's not so much saying this definitively does X definitely does Y, right? It's more like when we see this, this association occurs. Um, so always keep that in mind, especially when you're doing any of these at-home things. I think they can be great guides for you going forward, but they should never be taken as the word of God. I mean, nor should anything, but I just would keep that in mind that uh, they can guide you. They can give you some suggestions on ways that maybe you can shift what you're doing, uh, but they are not the end all be all of your total health. So with that little introduction ahead, I hope everyone's a little bit more educated now on your gut microbiome and what it is that we are doing here today. So don't forget to like, and subscribe this video for more videos. If you're interested to see what we are doing here and continuing on the experiment. Hello, microbial gal nation, and welcome to another episode of the micro moment that show that brings you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And I'm Julie. And today we're bringing you a very special show. We're hoping in the future to talk a little bit more about the method that goes into the results that we are obtaining. But for now, we were focused specifically on our Viome results between the three of us. So just a little bit about Viome specifically, when they give you the results, everything is on an app that is very easy to use. This video is in no way, shape or form sponsored by Viome. We independently purchased the kits, uh, tried it out and are doing this little video here today. So um, what does Viome give you? When you have the app, it asks you a little bit of a questionnaire to understand your lifestyle after you take your sample and ship it to them. And then it gives you copious amounts of information. And you could literally spend years reading everything on this sheet, I believe. So today we're trying to give you the highlights of what you can expect uh, and what are some of the things that we found through this. So one of the things that I really like about Viome is it organizes it in a way that if you just want the bare bones, if you just want the highlights, you can ease, they're easily accessible. You don't have to go through and read everything. But then what they also do is they link anything that they're saying to actual peer reviewed papers that you can click on and then go read if you're more interested in understanding where that information came from. So the way that they organize it is they talk about, they have a recommended food list and this recommended food list is broken down into four different categories. The first category is superfoods. The second is enjoy, which means you can have it pretty commonly followed by minimize, meaning you can eat it, but you shouldn't eat a lot of it. And then avoid, as in these are really bad for your microbiome at this stage, and you should not have it if you're trying to promote your gut microbiome according to their tests. They also look at, they also give you suggested supplement plan, and the supplement plan comes in two different varieties. The first is looking at specific probiotics or bacteria that they suggest that you intake in order to increase your diversity of your gut microbiome and the function of your gut microbiome. And then they also talk about supplements. So these can be things um, like vitamin A or protease or uh, magnesium or zinc that may help your microbiome because they saw some sort of deficiency in a function. They and even it, um, will suggest uh, uh, certain extracts as well from uh, plants. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole uh, slew of different extracts, supplements, uh, and probiotics. And then the final category is your overall score. And this is broken down as well. So you get an overall score and then you get individual scores for seven different categories. And the categories include inflammatory activity, metabolic fitness, digestive efficiency, gut lining health, 
protein fermentation, gas production, and active microbial diversity. So as John was saying, the amount or variety of microbes you have in your gut is really important for the functional capabilities of your gut microbiome. And it's generally regarded, the more diverse your microbiome is, the healthier you are. So without further ado, let's get into our results a little bit. And we're going to do this in a way where we're kind of going to ask each other questions and kind of open it for discussion. Um, so does anyone have a question that they'd like to start this discussion with? Did anybody get any that were good? Because none of mine were good. My uh, overall score was 40 out of 100, uh, which they say is not optimal. And then um, of the seven, you know, subcategories, I also did not get any that were considered good. I had some that were average, but none that were good. Yeah, my health was not good. I was at 44. The only one that I it says was good for me was inflammatory activity. The only one I got good with or good results with and everything else was average. I had, um, my overall was 45 out of a hundred. So, which is average. And then I had a couple of good ones, um, with metabolic fitness. So yeah, my metabolic fitness was good. And then my microbial diversity was good as well. Um, and just to put that in a little perspective, Viome does kind of tell you the proportion of the population, which are in those categories. And they do say that only 4% of the Viome population has an overall score of good, um, with 65 people, 65% having average and 31% of people having a not optimal score. So a score, um, what is that less than 35, I think would be suboptimal overall. This week's episode of the Micro Moment is brought to you by Zymo Research. Accurate and reproducible microbiome analysis relies on well-defined mock community standards as well as optimized methods for sample collection, nucleic acid extraction, library prep, and bioinformatics. Check out Zymo's complete microbiome workflow at zymoresearch.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H.com. So we definitely don't have perfect microbiomes, um, but we're not doing too bad either, I would say. Interesting. We're all pretty close to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think one other important difference between uh, the three of us um, is you guys are vegetarians and I am not a vegetarian. I try not to eat a lot of meat, but I do, um, I do eat meat. So I had two, my overall was not good or not optimal. And then there were two of the seven that were also not optimal. And the two that were not optimal were digestive efficiency and protein fermentation. So when I- Ooh, me I read, too. Oh, so uh, both of those? Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Ma. Um, so I was interested to see, you know, for protein fermentation, like I said, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do try to eat protein at every meal. Um, and that will usually consist of uh, like a Greek, I usually have Greek yogurt. Um, I will, I eat protein shakes sometimes. Um, I do, you know, so I do attempt to eat protein at every meal, but in looking at this, I don't know if I'm eating too much protein or if I am, um, if I'm not, my microbes are not digest or they are digesting too many. Cause what it said is that your, your digestion starts when you put a food, put food in your mouth. So as soon as you put food in your mouth, your saliva, your chewing action, that starts breaking down the food. And as it moves down your um, esophagus into your stomach, then it hits your, you know, stomach acids and, and all of the things that are going on there to digest your food. So what it said is that um, if your protein is not getting 
digested by those processes, your microbes will then go in and ferment those proteins. And but when they do it, when they break down the proteins, they are releasing, you know, harmful byproducts. Um, and so that is how they, you know, so when they take your sample, they can, they find those byproducts and, they, and that's how they determine that, you know, so for whatever reason, which I never even thought about how my body is digesting a certain food that I'm eating um, and affecting my health. Um, but that came up and it within the, the various, um, you know, the seven, you know, subcategories, you know, that comes up a, a few times that, you know, protein, I'm not digesting protein very well. The interesting for that section, they, so in every section, they give you suggestions on how to improve it. And on the protein, um, the protein fermentation one, it says a couple of lactobacillus, mostly a few lactobacillus species, and then citrus flavonoids, which I thought was interesting. I don't really know what the correlation is there. Um, and how that might improve protein digestion. But I think this is something I'm definitely interested to, to look in. More interestingly, I found was the food, one of my, or two of my superfoods um, and their fruits, papaya and pineapple. Um, they both are proteolytic enzymes, um, which break down proteins into amino acids. So by eating papaya and pineapple, those should help my protein digestion, which I think is really, really interesting. So do you, do you, have you had a lot of papaya or pineapple? I mean, we live in the Northeast, so getting papaya and pineapple is not easy and not cheap for sure. No. And, and those are, you know, frankly, ones that I, you know, I don't eat that often because I feel like they're kind of sugary. And so, you know, they're, and I, I probably, I definitely don't eat as much fruit and vegetables as I should. Um, but yeah, those are not two fruits that I, you know, eat at all, really. But I thought that was really interesting that by eating fruits, it might help me digest protein. So I thought that was kind of interesting how the two of you have this. Uh, we all have kind of different things to help promote our 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 protein uh, fermentation uh, score. Yeah, that's sort of interesting. I sort of thought that if you were bad, they would just give you a generic set of four or five things. But right. I guess it is. You said yours wasn't bad, right, John? It was average, yeah. It was average. Yeah, because mine is definitely not optimal. Mine was 70 out of 100. But um, for each, uh -oh, each section, I kind of like how we said there's like inflammatory activity. Each section is also subdivided, too. I was wondering if you'd be interested in, or like to talk about the subdivisions as well. Go for it. All right. Because like the subdivisions play into almost every, uh, everything we're talking about. So take a, uh, we'll go back to protein fermentations. We were talking about that. It looks at things like ammonia production, methane, so, uh, gas production, sulfite gas production, and crucine production as well. And these also like affect like inflammation and also uh, digestive health. Like they may slow down digestion, which is not good, but you see these in the other segments as well. So actually it's kind of weird. So mine was average, but three out of those four categories, I was not optimal. The only <laughs> thing I was good at was methane. So I Me would have thought, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I found so under protein fermentation, like you said, the the four items in there, I had, you know, three out of four were not optimal. The methane gas was optimal, but all four of those also show up in the digestive efficiency, um, which was the other um, metric that I was not optimal on. Um, so like for ammonia pr production uh, pathways, um, that you know, that they're not optimal means that that is kind of pro-inflammatory. And most people have probably heard about, um, you know, inflammation and, and body inflammation um, not being, you know, something that you uh, desire to go on um, really anywhere in your body and that it, it negatively affects your health. Um, so that uh, ammonia production 
pathway being, you know, pro-inflammatory, that's something that, you know, we could hopefully uh, address and, and that would be one way to reduce inflammation. Uh, it also said that that ammonia production uh, resulted in slow motility, um, which is the process, you know, your the food, you know, moves from your stomach, goes into your intestines and uh, your small intestines and then through your large intestine and then eventually um, out of your body. Um, so that motility, if, if it's slow, um, you know, it has, you know, you want things moving through, you want things, you know, moving through at the speed they're supposed to be, that'll be better for nutrition, you know, absorption. So I think that, uh, you know, slow motility is, is also kind of a bad thing. Things are not moving the way that they're supposed to. I think it's, it's really interesting that you just never get down to this level. Um, when you're eating your food, you're not thinking about these, you know, how it's affecting these, all these little systems. All right. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to discuss in the terms of the pathways or should we move on to food or supplements? I think, like you said, it's, it's really, really interesting, but it did take a good amount of, you know, kind of parsing through and and like I did like some research and, and basically copied everything down on here so that I could make sense of it myself um, outside of the app. And that might be just because I'm an old person. And, um, but I, I found, I think it's just fascinating all these little things that are, are going on, but you do have to really, uh, if you want to get to know it, you really have to read the, read it really carefully and just kind of get to know it, but it does start repeating itself a little bit. Um, once you get into, cause some of those pathways, like John said, are, you know, in several of the, uh, different measures. Yeah, it's definitely something that when you get your results, you got to spend the majority, a good portion your afternoon or your morning uh, on. It's definitely not like you do it. And then 15 minutes, you can review results. You really got to dig into it. So I want to talk a little bit about the food list that people have, because I think this is something that's really, really interesting. Were there any foods on your avoid list that you were surprised to see? Um, I had things on my list. uh, Apples celery, cucumber, onions, uh, spinach, and one good bit of news, no broccoli for me. Me too. Yay. I hate hate broccoli. broccoli. Um, You're welcome. John Uh, has it on his list and he likes broccoli. So I think my hatred from broccoli was stemming from my gut for the past 30 years. Yep. Me too. Checks out. I'm actually surprised at a couple things that are on my avoid list. Like what? Bell peppers. I love bell peppers. Mm-hmm. That's on my list too. Uh, Brussels sprouts. Me too. Um, Turmeric, <laughs> which is weird. Tumeric. Really? That's, that's a superfood for me. Yeah. Me too. And also tomatoes. Yeah. That's on mine too. It's, it's my favorite veggie. It's actually interesting when you look at tomatoes specifically though um we found that it's because they found the tomato mosaic virus in our gut microbiome yeah and it said for the t- tomato mosaic virus it it's been associated with uh stimulating the immune system and that in response would induce inflammation which i'm actually interested in how many people have tomato mosaic virus in their gut Because a lot of people have tomatoes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the same thing with all the viruses that they put. It's like we eat veggies, we eat fruits and vegetables that come from farms that have microbes on them. And we eat those microbes that are on those plants. So yeah, I would think that there's got to be a high proportion. It's interesting that Julie doesn't see tomato on her avoid list. Uh, Is they also have a list of foods everyone should avoid. Um, so there's another big list of, you know, French fries and flavored yogurt and white flour. And, and, and they have a whole list of things that they, they believe that people should be avoiding. Were there any foods that you knew before that worked well or not so well for you that came up on your list? Um, for instance, for all the diet of all the diets I've tried in the past, like 15 years of my life, uh, keto has always been the one that I felt the best on and on my superfoods or my enjoy list. There was a lot of 
fatty foods such as butter, olive oil, nuts, coconut milk, avocados, and seeds, which I thought was very interesting. And then on my avoid list, I had lima beans, um, which I have a very terrible reaction to. Did you guys find anything like that? One thing that makes me happy in my superfoods is cinnamon because I love me some cinnamon, but that's only really uh, the big thing for the superfoods. And I'm like, yeah. I don't think I was um, surprised. And I I think, you know, over the years, um, I've had a lot more years than you guys have to, uh, to try diets and and things. And I think it always comes back, back to, you know, trying to eat, you know, natural foods, not processed foods. Um, I did notice, you know, there really is not much mention in any of the lists as far as um, there's, you know, fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, cinnamon and things like that, but there's no bread, there's no pasta. I think the idea is, you know, that to be eating, you know, natural type foods, not processed foods um, is kind of a theme that over the years I've continued to see. And, and I, you know, there were a few things I was surprised that I felt were healthy foods. You know, like I said, apples and bell peppers and cabbage and, um, you know, those types of things I would consider healthy foods, but they're, they are on my avoid list. And I do think that they do say, you know, these might not be foods that you have to avoid forever. So there's a section that actually lists off what microbes they found in your gut. Does anyone have one that surprised you? I actually have two. Uh, One I didn't have, which was Ackermansia mucinophila which is you you did not find acromancia in your gut i did not and that's supposed to be really good for health um there's a lot of research that's pointing towards it one thing i did find and thankfully my gut microbiome is keeping in check but i did find c diff i have acromancia i do have c diff as well i don't know what any of that stuff is do you have acromancia acromancia Yes. Yes, I do. So one thing that I saw on that list that I was not, I guess maybe not surprised about, but sort of happy about was I had 11 different strains of bifidiobacterium in my gut and bifidiobacterium is like my favorite microbe. So it makes me happy that I am giving my favorite microbe a home all the time. (laughs) So my previous job, we had a mock humidity that we would research. And I found every one of those in my gut microbiome. And I swear I did not drink any of those cultures in my last job. But those, but that's good. Cause that mic, that mock microbiome was established as a probiotic, right? No, From natural microbes. No, it was, it was a representation of like a good, you know, of the, a good microbiome. Yeah. yeah. So it makes sense that you have that. That means it's a good representation. Although your microbiome is not optimal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you should call them up. Maybe say having those 11 are not all it's cracked up to be. Right. Um, I have 28 bifo- bifidobacterium. So, whoa. Way to go, Ma. If only I knew how I did it, or if it's a good thing. Mephidiobacterium and lactobacillus are the most researched probiotic species out there. So it's generally regarded anytime you pick up a probiotic from the store, you probably are going to see a number of lactobacillus strains as well as bifidiobacterium. Acromensia <laughs> is lesser seen in probiotics, but it's also probably one of the top researched microbes for probiotic ability or for optimizing health in research studies, I would say. Yeah. I've only seen in one probiotic. Yeah. It's not common in probiotics, um, but it is researched a lot in the gut microbiome. So does anyone have another question? You know, I, I think, cause one of my questions is, you know, how can you make changes? So obviously there's some improvement that can be made. Um, but how would you know if you you know, if you, if you don't retest, so I, I feel like it's sort of totally necessary to retest if you're really interested in, you know, can you make a difference? And I guess my question on that would be how long, how long does it take? Yeah. I think that'd be really cool to monitor over the time. Like, are these effective? How are these effective? I think it would be really interesting to, to know if some, if somebody did it 
just by food versus somebody who continued to eat what they were eating, but then they took the supplements, how would you be able to affect it, you know, real food versus, you know, the supplement route, or does it have to be in combination? Maybe that'll be our next experiment. We can tap on Viome for a little supplement pack and see (laughs) what we do. If three people here, you outline three different pathways. Maybe we can try that out. So I think before you even get to retesting though, you have to kind of say, are you willing to change anything? Are you going to adjust anything based on Viome's results? And if so, what are you going to try to do? What are you going to try to change? So I know the probiotic I've been taking doesn't really, I find it isn't really doing anything. I'm thinking of uh, getting a pro- probiotic that has the strains that they suggested for me to take. I mean, I'm no scientist and you guys are, but if you change a bunch of things, if, if you start taking a bunch of supplements and then you start eating all your superfoods and then you test again, do you know what actually, you know, made the change? Um, and obviously, you know, I'm getting older. I want to make sure that my body is as healthy as it can be so I can age healthy and, and stay active. Um, but I am, you know, I certainly am going to try and eat more of the superfoods, try and avoid some of the stuff that's on the, the list. You know, clearly I'm, I'm lacking some of these other strains. So I was going to look at, um, you know, adding a probiotic. Yeah. And I think what you just said there perfectly parallels with being a scientist. I think as scientists, we are given the opportunity to choose a single variable and hone in on it. Um, But as people trying to optimize your health, we don't have a total control over that. And as scientists, we face that same dilemma where we have thousands of different variables that we could choose and you kind of have to choose one and see how it affects. But if you choose a second one and added it with the first one, how does that affect? And so it's really just kind of an endless process in science where you're just picking out one single variable and kind of really trying to understand how that works in the system. Um, But then you lose how the whole system is working in reality, which is as humans at what we are, we are working in reality and how, what is the best way to optimize our health? So I think it is interesting. um, And I often think there is a, a lot of evidence that elimination diets are great, but they can take a really long time and they take a lot of discipline. So I do think it's sort of interesting having this results that we have now and whether or not that helps us get over that elimination diet. I think my challenge for you guys is to pick one or two foods on your avoid list and try to avoid them for the next month and pick one or two things on your superfood list uh, and try to incorporate at least one superfood every day. And we'll kind of assess if we feel any better, um, if we see any change or feel any change in a month. What do you guys think? I'd be down to try that. Yep. And I, yeah, I think the, you know, part of my goal is, is I need to, you know, I would like to lose about 30 pounds. Um, so I think that's a measurable, a measurable goal. Excellent. Well, Microbi Gal Nation, that is the end of our show. We hope you enjoyed it as always. And we thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video anywhere that you are listening to it, because next time we will talk a little bit about Zoe results. And then hopefully we will compare our Zoe results with our Viome results and get someone from Zoe or Viome to come talk to us as well. So we have a lot of really cool things with this little micro experiment coming up and we'd love to share it with you. So once again, don't forget to like, and subscribe to learn more about our Zoe Viome comparison. We also have a website too, where we post blogs regularly. It's microbogals.com. You should really check it out. We're posting regularly and we're bringing microbiology to you. And check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Uh, We're on all three at microbogals. Let us know if you've tried the Viome or Zoe and what your results told you. Until next time. bye. Bye. Bye.